I find a kind of a little flaw or wrinkle in this celebration. Here, the last Sunday of the church year for us, a big solemnity, Christ the King. And we're looking at Christ at the end of time, judging between the good and the bad, the sinners and the graced. And um, the trouble is that we don't really have a tradition of kings and queens in the United States of America, and I don't think in any of the countries present here, really. Um, it, it's, it's not part of our culture or experience. I know we know of, uh, the Queen of England died, and there was a lot of hurrah and celebration over that. And, um, and then the, the king was named, and one family rules for, what, hundreds of years? And, and um, at least in olden times, uh, whatever a king or queen said, the law. In fact, in, I remember even as a kid in cartoons where you'd have a king there sitting on the throne and he'd say, off with his head! And the head came off because the king said it. But we know enough about kings and queens to appreciate the word. We even, for God's sake, even have um, uh, the Lion King. So we have all kinds of kings that we know of. But the word today touches this in some beautiful ways. In the first reading from Ezekiel, in Ezekiel, God is speaking and says, I will shepherd my people like a shepherd shepherds his flock. And then it goes almost through a litany. Uh, I will go out and find the lost and bring them back. I will carry those wounded on my shoulders. I will feed them. I'll give them drink. I will, I will care for them. I will love them. Um, and then makes that distinction between the goats and the rams or goats and the sheep. And that will be carried through in the gospel. But in that first reading, we hear about a loving king. A king could do anything to protect his sheep. Then in the second reading, Paul goes on and tells us that we have followed Christ into death so that we could follow him into resurrection and life. And at the end of that reading, it says God is all in all. And so we get this all-embracing God and, of course, we're playing back and forth between the king of all creation and, and, and kind of mixing up God as the king of all creation, then the son of man as the king of all creation. But then we shift as we come to this gospel passage. And Jesus Christ is sitting on the throne. Now, Matthew is the one who writes this particular passage. And um, it's beautiful, Matthew. It's perfectly parallel. Uh, he separates the sheep and goes, he says, you fed me when I was hungry, gave me drink. When did we do that? Uh, when did we feed you and give you drink? And it repeats it all, but now through the words of the, of the people who are being judged. And then you didn't feed me and didn't give me drink and didn't visit me in jail or ill. When did we do that to you? Feed you, visit you in jail or ill? And they said, when, when you didn't do it to the least. So in this parallel passage, and it ends, though, with God welcoming the sheep the sheep are on my right, so you are welcome to the kingdom. Sorry, goats, but you're on the left, okay? And the goats are going to H-E, I won't finish it, okay? You know where that is. Now, personally, you have to agree with me, but I just don't believe that God is sending people to hell. I just don't. I, uh, he rescues us somehow, somehow. And even if it's at the moment of death that we finally get a glimpse of God. I don't think you can turn God down when you really see him, but there's a lot of things that can blind us. And I think the gospel even reveals some of that. So, uh, Jesus says to those on his right, I was hungry, thirsty, ill, naked, and you did all these things for me. When did we do it to you, Lord? When you did it to the least, you were brothers and sisters. Where you can all go because I was hungry, thirsty, ill, naked, in prison, and you didn't take care of me. When did we do it for you, Lord, when you didn't do it for the least? So I'm going to throw this back on y'all. First of all, Grandma and Grandpa, please stand. Anita, Celso, stand just for a moment. Stand up just for a moment. This is Grandma and Grandpa. You can be seated. Now your children stand. Children. Next generation. Okay, very good. You can be seated. Now your child. This is the grandson. And your child, this is the great-grandson. So there are four generations here. That's good, that's good. Four generations. That's a big chunk of time for a family. Four generations of faith. And these two 
being welcomed into faith through baptism. Now, Noah, cute as a pin, doesn't have a clue what's happening. There's only two things that Noah cares about in life right now. It's mas leche and mas pampers. Those are the two things. That's it. If he gets, if he gets milk and pampers, he is delighted. He's even smiling just because I said those two words. Valentino, you're old enough, and the church says if you're seven years old, this is what we call the age of reason. So we don't just baptize him because he comes to the church to be baptized. We form him, and we share with him. So we shared with him, I think, one of the toughest passages of the Bible, in my opinion, again, chapter 25 of Matthew. Because Jesus doesn't just say, do this for me. He says, you'll find me in the least. So I'm going to ask you, I don't want an answer. This is rhetorical, Valentino. Do you have anybody who bullied you in life in school? Don't shake your head or anything, okay? It's not important. Or somebody that hurt your feelings of first love, and she turned you down, and she looked at you and went, ew, and you just were crushed. And you cannot forgive her or will not forgive her or whatever. Or something that uh, someone in your family did that made you feel rejected. And, and whatever, the, whatever the experience, that this person somehow became least in your life. Least in your life. That there was a flaw now in your relationship. I'll give you one in my own family. When I was a little boy, I was number five out of six. My dad was 40 when I was born. And, and um, most all my family lived in Kansas. And uh, we used to go back there, and some of them would come out. And I had this uncle, my dad's youngest brother, Robert Dean. And I'm Perry Dean. And I think I got my middle name Dean because Robert had the middle name Dean, and that's what they did. They all imitated each other's names, I guess. So uh, they had two sons, Donnie and Davey, and I, we knew them well. On the Liker side, that was one of my closest families. And um, when I was about 14, Robert Dean divorced his wife, Anne, or she divorced him, I don't know which. But I was shocked. Up until that time, I had one aunt, my dad's uh, older sister, uh, who was divorced. And I knew that, I mean, she was divorced when I became of age that I could even understand what that word meant. And so I always knew that, and it was kind of like in those days, back in the 50s, that was like, ooh, a divorced person in the family. But I love my Aunt Lydia, so. But then when Robert Dean and Anne divorced, something happened, and my dad taught me a great lesson. We went back to Kansas, and we went to the house of Robert Dean, where his sons were, and we visited, blah, 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 blah. And then my dad said, we're going to go over and see Anne tomorrow. And that was the divorced one. And he said, look it, she's my sister-in-law. I don't care what happened between her and Robert Dean. That's their problem. But she's my sister-in-law. And I like her. And, I, and not because our name is like her, but he said, I like her. And, and we're going to go visit. And that taught me a great lesson because in a way, either Robert Dean or Anne or both might have been looked at now as the least. They're divorced. In those days, uh, divorce is one out of two now, I think. But, and he taught me that no matter how little or least a person is, we should be able to find Christ in them. Now, if you'll notice what I did today, because it's a big solemnity, we incensed the altar, but we also incensed the gospel book. You'll notice I held it up in procession and presented it to everybody. And after I read the gospel, I kissed the book. Because we're supposed to not just listen to the Word and then say, oh, God, I have to love the least now. We're supposed to love the Word, kiss the Word. The Word is supposed to penetrate into our hearts. And when it does, everything changes. If the Word of God penetrates into our heart, if the teachings of Jesus get inside our heart, we will be transformed. And if we are not transformed, Look at the fruit of this. Look at Russia and Ukraine. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Even if this war ends, hopefully soon, how many years will they hate each other? How many years? How many will never get over their hate of Russia, ever? Look at Palestine and Israel. 
Gaza Strip and Israel, the thousands of people that have been killed in Palestine. One man made the decision. And all of that death, all that, have you seen the news what's happened to their cities? They're demolished, just rubble. You think they'll forgive Israel? I doubt it. The vast majority, no, but definitely they're the least in their eyes. And Jesus goes right to that. What you do to your enemy, you do to me. And what you fail to do for your enemy, you fail to do for me. This is an all-encompassing, powerful, transformative word that saves us. And if you notice the opening prayer, it comes up about three times in the prayers of the Mass today. This tells you what this feast and these readings are supposed to be doing to us. It says, grant, Son, King of the universe, grant, we pray, that the whole creation set free from slavery, set free from slavery, what slavery? Slavery to sin. Even slavery to the law, because you can say, you know, um, if, if you can't stand spinach and, and your mom says, eat your spinach, Okay, I'll eat my spinach. Well, that's not exactly the best way of eating your spinach, hating it all the way and getting upset with your mom. But if that's what we do the law of God, if that's what we do with this reading, we can do it, but our heart be far away from it. And Jesus is saying, no, no, I want you to love this word. Not just live it, love it. Love it, because it will redeem and the prayer over the gifts will say, as we offer you, O Lord, the sacrifice by which the human race is reconciled to you, that somehow this cross and the forgiveness that flowed from that cross is a reconciling love, that we don't have to hate those who hate us. And if we do hate those who hate us, we're no better than those haters. We've just become haters too. But it's a powerful word and it's a difficult word. But in the preface, right before we sing holy, 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 this is the kind of kingdom that the king of all creation is inviting us to share in. He's talking about an eternal and universal kingdom, a kingdom of truth and life, a kingdom of holiness and grace, a kingdom of justice, love, and peace. Is that what we want? That's what Jesus wants for us. That's what we understand God to be calling us to. And, you know, when I was a young priest in St. Felicity of Perpetua, I used to marvel because in that particular parish, my pastor liked that one preacher would preach all the masses. So I might only celebrate one, but I'd preach at all five of them. And then the next week, I wouldn't preach at all because another priest would preach, and it just would keep rotating. So I used to say, wow. What a privilege as a priest. For me, celebrating the Mass is beautiful. I don't lessen that in any way, but it's the preaching that challenges me the most and that, that grabs my heart the most because I get the possibility, like right now, there's probably about 250, 300 people here. I have the possibility of changing the hearts or affecting the hearts of 300 people. And if I only reach one, if I reach one person that is transformed by this word and says, oh, how right you are. You've given me life. Wow, what a privilege. What a privilege. But what if half of us do? What if 75% of us hear this word and are transformed by it? This is life-giving. Now, in just a moment, we're going to baptize Noah. And when I sat at my chair, I happened to look over here. It's gone now, but Light was hitting the water in such a way that it was shining up on the wall, the water. And like it is on the wood right now, you see the rippling of the waves and, and the light, and it was on the wall. And it, it summoned up in me this idea of life-giving waters. There's two symbols that we'll use now at the baptism part. We will baptize first with water. And why water? Because after oxygen, water is the most important thing simply to live. Has anybody here ever been dehydrated enough that you had to go to the hospital for it? Anybody? You don't want to raise your hand. Yeah, you shouldn't. But we can be, especially as we get older. Dehydration is a major, major 
possibility for serious illness. So we have been told all our life, drink about eight glasses of water a day, do it. Like Nike says, just do it. Just do it because we need to be hydrated. After water, we will anoint with oil. And oil is a very powerful symbol, a very biblical symbol, because the nature of oil is that it gets into the pores of your skin. It enters into your body. And as we put the oil on and see that happen, know that the oil is penetrating the body, we're praying not for that. We're using that to pray that God's spirit and grace will penetrate the life and soul of the young Noah. And when that happens, the possibility of this transformation becomes real. So you can remain there for a moment, but if you could all extend your hands over these life-giving waters, okay? They're rippling right now, and, and they have, uh, like any water, life, but the spiritual water is a, a spiritual life, a life of, of God's spirit and grace. So...